hello there. Even more time travel debugging. Okay, so in my previous video, I showed how to find functions and jump backwards to a function. This time, let's use the time travel timeline to perform even more advanced actions. Let me show how to plot functions, breakpoints, and even memory allocations onto the timeline. Okay, let's get to it. Let me switch to my WinDebug view. What we have on screen is an instance of WinDebug over here and an instance of an application over here. There is nothing special about this application over here. The title bar is missing. That's because the capture software is not able to capture the title bar. But there is nothing special about this application. All it does is that when I click the generate exception button over here, it will generate an exception. We will use that and plot that exception onto the timeline so that we can see when the exceptions are occurring and we will use that capability to put breakpoints, memory allocations and even look for the functions before and after the exceptions. So since the application is running, uh, let me just remove it from screen. What we want to do is we want to attach the process so that we can enable the time travel. So we go to file, we go to attach to process and then from the list we choose the process um, my program is just called MFC Application 1. Um, it's easy to find here. Then we click uh, Record with Time Travel Debugging and click the Configure and Record button. What we get is we get this screen over here. Let me just load it up in my recording software. There we are. We get the screen over here. And this dialog over here says Save Location. This location is where the time travel debugging files are going to be written. So just press Record and that will start the recording. Now, when the recording is running, you should get this screen over here. Let me just put that screen in view. So you're gonna get this dialog over here. Do not close this dialog. Instead, what we wanna do is, uh, we just want to generate some events with the application and then just close the application. So I'm gonna click generate exception, maybe around five, six, seven times. And then I'm go just going to press OK to close the application. And this is going to trigger the debugger to complete the time travel. Once WinDebug is ready, what we need to do is we need to load all the symbols and make sure the path to the source code is correct. So let me go ahead and quickly load all the symbols. So I always start with simfix. Then I'm going to add my path to the uh, symbols for the application. Reload it. Then proceed with the source path which is just source path. There we are. Let's reload it one more time. And the reason we do that is because when we attach to a process, WinDebug may not be able to discover where the symbols are. Sometimes when you build an application, if the source code and the symbols are in the same identical full path where the debugger put it, it'll work. But generally, I just always run simfix and put the symbols manually to guarantee that they always load correctly. So let's start debugging. I've actually cleared the screen because something happened to my WinDebug. So the first thing you want to do is you want to go to time travel and you want to go to index. What index does is it makes memory searching a bit quicker and we are going to be adding memory to the timeline. So it's a good idea to index. And then what we can see in the timeline is these red marks over here. These marks are the exceptions. I covered in a previous video how to click on the exceptions and go to a particular location. So let's do that. Let me click on one of these exceptions over here. What will happen is the timeline will move to that position. And then if I run KM, I will get the uh, stack. Let's view the source code. So if I click on frame number three, I'm going to get some source code. Let me just make the screen a bit wider so that we can see a bit more. I think that should be enough. So we can see the source code for frame number three and we can use this to actually add more information to the timeline and actually manipulate the time travel using the timeline itself. Now I can see the function do something on my screen. Let's add this function to the timeline so that we can see all the instances in which this function was called. So what I can do is I click add timeline and then I will select within this dialog. 
let me give me a sec let me just add it to my capture software okay so i'll get this dialogue over here called timeline type there is a header to this dialogue over here but you you can't see it because the capture software is having a bit of trouble with all the headers but what i can do is i can choose function calls and i can put in the symbol for the function call what i need to do is i need to put in the full windybug symbol which is the module name with a pipe c processor do something this is the full symbol that you use to search for symbols what this dialog does is that it uses that syntax to actually search for the function symbol and when it finds it then it will plot it onto the timeline i'm just i'm just going to take the start location we can forget about the end location so if i press end what's going to happen is it's going to plot the timeline over here once the function has been plotted I can click on this green symbol over here and the timeline will actually jump to the start of the function. This is really handy if you want to just find the number of times a function was called. So I can see from this information over here, the function was called one, two, three times before the first exception. And then each time the function was called, there was an exception. This also works for breakpoints. I can put a breakpoint over here and I can then go to add timeline uh, let me just get the screen to appear from the capture software. Okay, so it's the same screen as before, but I can choose breakpoints. When I choose breakpoints, I can choose from a list of breakpoints that I've added. The same thing happens. It will plot the breakpoints into the timeline. It takes a, a little bit of time to do it because you have to load the symbols. So what I'll do is I will fast forward the video if it's too slow. I see that it has loaded and it has plotted correctly. So if I click on each one of these circles, it's going to forward the cursor directly to the point where the breakpoint would have hit. Now this by itself is pretty handy because we can look at the function. We can look at the number of times the function was called and we can jump around the breakpoints going forward and backwards. What we can also do is we can actually view memory while doing so. So I'm going to choose locals over here and I can see that the counter, the value is four. And if I go backwards, I can see that the counter changes to three. If I go backwards again, it changes to two. I go forward again, it changes to six. And so this is really handy jumping forward and backwards in order to see what the content of a variable is. Now there's another feature in which we can actually watch when memory changes because when we move forward and backwards with the breakpoint, we can actually see that the value of the counter is changing, but we can actually plot that onto the timeline as well. So how we do that is a bit complicated. What we need to do is within this location over here, I'm just gonna run DV. The reason I run DV is I wanna get the memory address. Now, if I click on the this point over here, I can see that the counter is located at position zero at the memory address of the object. This is very important because what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the timeline to track memory based on this pointer over here. If counter is anywhere else, just make sure that you get the correct offset of where the memory is. Let me just move the screen a bit so that you can see clearly what I'm talking about, which is this memory address over here which is basically just the this pointer over here. Uh, this is just the long form and this is just the shorter form of the uh, memory address. Um, on my system, uh, this is a 64-bit uh, system, so the pointers will look a bit longer, but it's all zeros in the front, so it doesn't really matter that much. So what I do is I click Add Timeline, and then I choose uh, Memory Access. Let me just show you the screen over here. I need to uh, adjust my capture software yet again because it can't capture these screens. So if I choose memory access, which is the timeline type over here, memory access, I get a start address and a end address. So if I just add the start address over here and then I choose the end address, but what I want to do is because I know that this variable is four bytes, I want to add an end address, which is four bytes after that. So if I take this value over here and I add four bytes, one of the handy tricks I can do is I can actually ask WinDebug to calculate what is 4 bytes. This is a really handy trick in which you can do. In which if you just put a question mark in WinDebug and put a memory address and just put an expression over here, just say like plus 4, which is plus 4 bytes. WinDebug will actually calculate what the address should be. 
really really handy trick in order to get uh, uh like quick, quick calculations but if your brain is like a calculator just just forget this just calculate in your head it's just adding four bytes to the uh, address okay let's go ahead and add the memory address uh, let me just adjust my capture software yet again because it it has a really hard time capturing dialogues so i'm just gonna put in my memory address over here and i'm gonna put in the um, four bytes later and i'm gonna put the uh, address for read uh you can choose write you can choose execute execute is gonna be a pretty rare one because if it's a variable you probably don't have execute permissions on the memory anyway so read and write will work fine so if you click add it will add a timeline where it will put the access points for the um, variable. But here's the thing. This takes a very long time because it has to walk through all the memory to figure out where the access was. I will fast forward the video until the point that uh, it's ready. Okay, so after some time, we have the timeline is ready. Um, this timeline is all the instances with this yellow diamond over here of when the memory address was read. So let's do this again, but this time let's put all the writes so that we can see the difference between the read and the write. So I know that the this pointer, the counter is at position zero. So I'm just going to take this memory address over here and I'm going to add timeline. I'm going to add the memory address. Uh, let me just adjust my capture software again. And there we have it. This is the memory address. I'm going to add it again and this time I'm going to add it as write. So let me just make this window a bit smaller. Oh, I can't do that. Make it a bit longer. So I'll fast forward the video until the point that this timeline is ready to go. Okay, so the timeline is ready. So the first value over here, R. Oh, I, I can't put my cursor. So the, the first timeline that, that has the R up here is the timeline where I'm reading the memory. And the second one is where I'm writing. So if I click on the yellow diamond over here, it goes to this position which is reading the memory but if i click on the other yellow diamond it goes to the position where it's writing the memory which is the plus plus m counter so i can see all positions where the memory is written to and i can see all positions where the memory is read we can also see that there are some additional reads and writes over here and this is because the object is eventually destroyed when i close the application so there will be extra reads and writes over here but these are not really relevant because they are not within the uh, correct space of symbols. But if you had additional reads and writes, uh, they will appear on the timeline um, correctly as long as the symbol for the location exists. I can't click on any of the symbols up here because they are, I don't actually have the symbols for these locations here. So these are not so relevant. But I can click on these positions here and actually see the timeline move to show me every place and location in which this variable is written to than every location where this variable is read. The time travel feature to track memory is really slow because it has to load a lot of symbols in order to figure out where the entries are on the time travel for the memory location that was given. There is syntax in which I can type to help the heap, but the syntax is very complicated because it needs to use the debugger model over here, which is a bit more complicated to use so i will skip that and keep that for a future video the time travel feature especially the function feature where you can plot the functions is really handy because you can jump forward and back the memory feature is a bit complicated this kind of simple usage where i just look at a variable in a class this works really well but if you try to put something sophisticated it doesn't work that well I will make a video in the future in which I'll do a very sophisticated lookup for the heap and then I'll plot that onto the timeline to make it easier to look at memory. Anyway, I wish a few years ago when I was very active in C++ development that I had these features in order to time travel because WinDebug is difficult enough. If I had the time travel feature, it would have been awesome. I remember the countless hours of stopping and restarting applications over and over to try to reproduce a problem before an exception. I can just imagine if you had time travel, you can just jump forward and backwards and look at the memory while doing so. And that would have helped me a lot. I just wish I had these features years ago. Anyway, let me know in the comments below if you have used the time travel feature before. And a gentle reminder to subscribe Hit that bell icon and give me a like if you like the content. As always, 
It's been a pleasure bringing you this information. I am High Voice, signing out.